Hello everyone, today we talk about the transformation of the Roman legionary from the, let's say, mid-third to the sixth, end of the fifth century uh, AD, of course. And you know that I choose my daily topics randomly, and theoretically this one should have been a video rather on, on the transformation of the equipment properly meant of, of the legionary infantry uh, specifically, but you know that I don't like very much the, you know, just focusing on the weapon to explain uh, such uh, long transformations we will make, and we have already made actually at this point, dedicated videos to the equipment only, right? Um, and we will keep doing that, uh, passing through every single, in, in detail, through helmets, swords, uh, armor, etc. And today we partly keep uh, on that track, but trying to frame this transformation in a you know, longer, you know, say in a broader perspective, and obviously not for, you know, judging the transformations through the weapons themselves, through the armament itself, which seems to be a very common thing to do, as there are legitimately many people who uh, practition also with ancient uh, weaponry, replicas, and reenactment, etc. But, um, there let's say that there are different levels of um, explaining such things. I mean, one thing is naturally the functionality of the weapon in itself. The other thing is realizing, let's say, in a bit broader uh, reasoning, why this thing came about and how this gear came about. And uh, from from a, a perspective that naturally can't be the weapons themselves, as we have to be very clear about this, that Norm normally it's tactics that create weapons, it's not the other way around, right? Technology is always adapted to needs and it's created and, and innovations um, comes through that pattern, right? Um, so actually there are a lot of topics here to, to be uh, addressed because one is, strictly speaking, understanding a weapon in a system that goes far beyond the individual soldier. Right, and that has, uh, you know, uh, that it was framed within uh, a unit, uh, an army, and, and connected to politics and, and society. So it's not just, you know, what's the best weapon, ideally, and by the way, for which task? Because at this point, we're talking about a universal empire fighting a most, uh, against some, in fact, the most diverse types of enemies, and also and needing to cope with each one of them um, in, in with the same formula that could be good enough to to cope with, with all of these. This is the, the formula. Like to, something that, in order to work, doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be good enough. And what's perfect anyway, right? Uh, what's perfect anyway when you have to fight enemies like such as the Alamanni or, or the Sassanids, right? And you have to naturally you you can diversify your own troops which partially happens but that that's not about you, the enemies you're facing either it's about how your state is is faring as in, in as much as you know whether it's capable of stemming this threat where does it get the resources from so once again the weapon in itself is not the key to the explanation it can tell you something very interesting in terms of individual combat even of you know larger units um, and and how they they perform in the field but uh, first of all we also should be very very clear about this fact how these armies actually fought is universally and renownedly unknown that is there's not a single person in this world that can come here and says okay these guys fought in this way why because I, I, I use the sword and I think I can be used in this way there are many hypotheses, some are better than others, right? Uh, there is no doubt about this, but they're just hypotheses. That is to say, we don't know even how these guys were arrayed on the field. How can you know how did this whole thing worked? And people say, no, no, we'll know how they were arrayed because we have the sources here, the states that, yeah, because sources, the state things is, you know, uh, um, the true reality um, of warfare, and uh, you you can you know swear on it on and bet on every, everything you have that that that's exactly what happened on the field, and even if there is a source, there are actually, and we will address these things in a separated video. But uh, 
um, uh, still that doesn't tell things for example how um, how large um, what was the the order of this formation was it close was it was it broad like we have only two sources in the whole military history of the Roman army that basically tells you different things that they're from different times and from from one picture the legion would be something deployed kind of in a, with a close order and the other one uh, instead pictures it as thick uh, as a phalanx basically and that's literally all we know about this then we have of course iconographic evidence but what's iconographic evidence anyway it's an artistic depiction very often also uh, propagandistic and it it's still you know uh, with all the uh, beauty and value of the art of the time, still it's not meant to be a scientific representation of what happened on the field. So every person who comes there to you and tells you, oh, I, I know better, right, because I have such a long experience in these studies and I know how they really fought, and it tells you exactly how many centimeters there was be between a legionnaire and another. Well, you can't say that person, go waste someone else's time, right, <laughs> as well as yours, or but maybe just don't waste anybody's time um, but yours um, and the, uh, the the thing is really like this I mean if you uh, and this is a big point that is chiefly methodological the second one is also being uh, ac acquainted to the historiography right and admit that myself mm, I don't have such a great um, expertise in late antiquity i i've read a lot of stuff i even studied something at some point but um you know i i'm, I'm i haven't had the, the time and the opportunity and uh, even the will because i started other things to cover all the bibliography so even in here take always this information as um, more like a perspective this can be an introduction we already made videos on the late Roman army and if you have watched them you more or less know what opinions I have um, and they're fundamentally like in line with what the, the you know the historiography as far as I know has, has come at this point to to stress I think more in general the problems we have with uh, framing correctly Roman history, uh, leaving aside warfare in itself, is is are much greater. Like uh, the the more they pass, and the more I realize that we have completely missed the point with Roman history from one thousand years to this point. I mean, what we have built thinking about Rome is essentially a creation ex post. Um, Roman civilization and culture uh, was was something extremely different from which is pictured. Uh, and this unfortunately has given um, rise to this mm, terrible fanatism, I would say, that exists, um, that splits people in general. Like, it, it doesn't matter whether you're a Roman fanboy or uh, a Roman hater, and it's pretty stupid to be both of them in the first place as, as an attitude towards history. Like, you're not personally, um, you know... Uh, related to those times and events at the point of uh, being competent about them. You know nothing about them if you don't have an actual historical education. And also, no, you're not the descendant of this or that, like you're not either Roman or, or only or German only or whatever you think you are, right? And when you study these things, the best thing you can make a good service to the memory of these people is to read the historical sources and study them very carefully otherwise shutting the fuck up um, so um, many people have been obsessed I mean, and, and I really mean it um, by this uh, kind of modernistic technologistic positivistic and progressivistic idea of Roman history right this idea of the high empire and the low empire uh, the concept of the true Rome of of early of the early empire. I mean, if Romans from the third century BC had looked at what was the Rome of Augustus or Trajan or or Marcus Aurelius, they would have said, "My gods, <laughs> right? Uh, this is not what 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 we were, right? Uh, what's what's true Rome? Actually, uh, it, it's incomprehensible from a sheer historical point of view. It, it's something that makes no sense whatsoever." Um, if not in the broader, but not even in the in the broader and later sense of the universal empire, because that's an achievement that has been accomplished later, right? That is also framed in mindset that uh, 
originated from the uh, awareness of the presence of, un of a universal dimension of the world in itself um, and that is tied with also with the ancient tribal thing so it, it's very complicated with tries to, to, to shed light on this um, once again the best thing we can do is to label the least as much as we can but one of the greatest prejudices and also one of the most radically stupid misconceptions about uh, Roman history and warfare is the alleged decline like the idea of the best Roman military performance being set fundamentally within the boundaries of the early empire the Roman principate or whatever you want to periodize that temporally and that what came later was substantially an inferior military instrument and what's inferior anyway because here you you have to put it in relation to something and if you realize which kind of threats which with, with which amount of results and um and with which outcome the roman military in 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 the 4th century for example um performed well i mean what what's this inferior what you see is the exact contrary of this that is the 4th century roman army was objectively um, much more effective both in attack and in defense than the Roman military had ever been uh, um, especially from a tactical point of view if you look characteristically at you know the, the transformations we'll try to, to frame loosely today to a sort of uh, picture uh, concise picture um, where this, where, where's this decline exactly and what the hell are you talking about in the first place if you even know the most elementary notions of late Roman military history um, this is unfortunately it goes along with the usual imbeciles who come and say that they can't even you know put a correct order to the transformation of the Roman equipment Right, those people who believe that that was a moment in the early empire in which basically every Roman legionnaire was equipped uh, with the so-called uh, lorica segmentata in the square scutum, and and they can swear on their mothers that every single Roman legionnaire was exactly and uniformly and absolutely for hundreds of history exactly and only exclusively like that right and that every other difference did not exist and if you if you deny that you are the ignorant right well, normally these people do not even have read a book of roman military equipment um and they're probably some of it, that's a pretty good uh, thermometer to spot one of the most disgustingly and grossly ignorant scum that exists on this earth uh, and being very very cruel in here but we have to set this thing straight because after generations and generations of historians that have written oceans of inks on these topics and like knowing that that is completely false uh, by all the evidence that we 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 can have and it's not that there is much to opinate on it this is not a universe where you know we have millions of sources like this is we have always those sources and, and those very sources show us a very different thing uh, you can't be uh, soft on someone who who doesn't even acknowledge that such a huge um, historiographical effort has been made right and let him get get away with that so i i'm actually very very um uh, active in saying to let's emarginate and um discriminate every imbecile that pretends to talks about things that he or she doesn't not know right girls usually don't care about this topic so let's leave the she out <laughs> no it's not true actually there are many girls that are interested in these topics and they they they're very competent by the way also many re reen actresses uh I also have the pleasure to meet to meet i mean around my my trips and uh would know what we're talking about but the problem here i'm i'm t uh, i'm talking is very serious because this is actually a, a something that came very very newly about like i think people 30 years ago had the s similar kind of prejudices but objectively they were not exposed to a kind of uh, popular culture and information that 
uh, somewhat gave them not much just the possibility of knowing certain things, but also to, you know, to, to form a, a, a real culture and education uh, about them, right, correctly speaking. So it's normal then, I don't know, a boomer on average thinks maybe, which is not, you know, not all of them, of course, but that, you know, that, that not even the problem came came about for them, right? Uh, let's be honest, it's about mostly the um, the millennials that have been raised, we have been raised with all these impulses from video gaming and uh, this very visual uh, approach to um, to the historical um, to the historical information that we craved for when we were very little, we still didn't maybe even have the internet, we or you know that there wasn't this great beyond besides um movies right um and that and we have appreciated more this mm, enrichment that has undoubtedly come through the internet i think the internet does create problems like everything but it's you know on average i mean uh a, overall a very positive thing and that's the reason why, if you're rising now, you you can't say you can't you don't even have the excuse that you you've not been exposed to to such uh, sources and information because literally every single Roman source about the Roman army is universally open access um, on the internet. You don't even have to struggle in order to find it, and every other judgment is um, uh, you know every other bias attached to it is so easily spotable, right? But do you think you feel you're competent about the Roman army because you come from a certain country, because you have, I don't know, a certain uh, pretension that that was one of the single most important things to do for which uh, that, that, uh, I don't even know, that, that uh, it, it's notorious, so you don't even have to, to study it from, from history books. Or you think that you're you're you feel better if you come on the floor and start pretending to know something uh, about history, like talking about football matches, like where every idiot can literally say his own uh, idiocy and getting away with that, right? That history is not that, right? History is a serious thing, and albeit there is no truth. Um, in the in in the measure information is delivered by by people right which is a huge problem um there is a, a, a truth uh, behind historical reality so the, the closer you get to historical accuracy and the the better you 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 can make uh, not only with history in itself but also with your life because history helps you to put information in perspective and developing this depth this of vision of, of critical skill right so um it's 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 not just about the the normal ignorance on historical issues that is probably one of the greatest uh, plagues of our of our times and it will create an enormous problem politically speaking in the next um yeah definitely in the next decades and it's already happening actually but um, the point is, if if you don't, I mean, if you fail in understanding things like these, what what's what are the chances to have a broader understanding of much more complex problems in your political and social environment? I mean, it's basically zero. I I do believe that there are people who objectively are not fit for um, enjoying a, a certain part of uh, civil. Uh, civil freedoms because I, I think it could be dangerous for the rest of society, right? We should it's like, after all, who does the science when, when you come of age uh, juridically speaking, or where you can drive a car, the same should go for whether you can vote or not, right? We're not in a time in which you're prevented from voting if like like you're less rich and, uh, and therefore there are struggles because of classes no, today we live in a world in which yeah, there are poor people but um, still they can be intelligent and educated, and they, they normally are, and are still much more affluent than they have ever been before in the history of mankind, and therefore, really, the discriminant should be the, uh, maybe not just the ignorance, but the stupidity as such, because, I mean, ignorance in itself is not a problem, or better, it, we wish it wasn't, right? But as, as soon as you contaminate ignorance with the presumption and the arrogance and the um, 
delusion that you can have things without having earned them, that that is a problem. The same goes for civil freedoms, right? Civil rights in itself, like um, uh, there are not just rights. There, the, uh, for every right, there is a duty, and people seem to be forgetting about this largely, right? That things can happen magically, right? Can come out of the blue without nobody working for it, uh, you know, as if you know resources in this. In our societies were uh, infinite or they weren't earned also by someone else who, who has some merit for them. So these are all uh, probably issues that you don't care if you clicked on this video for knowing about the late Roman army. But uh, they're, they're much more related to it than, than you can imagine. Right? Um, so to, to frame this period a little bit, uh, as I was saying before, the late Roman army was one of the most brutally sophisticated military machines ever created in ancient history. I mean, there is no doubt about this of any sort, right? Um, what is that? Why do we call, what do we approximate as the late Roman army? Because objectively, there were some reforms, as you know, that uh, were fundamentally um, uh, characteristic of certain periods, certain centuries, but uh, the army uh, still trans somewhat transformed over time. Well, if you look at the third century, the, the Severian reform basically created these graphs on the basis of what was fundamentally the Marian reform, right? The, the Augustian times had definitely given a permanent and full uh, professional character to the, to the Roman uh, militia. Um, and um, uh, throughout the third century, d during the so-called crisis of the third century uh, the Roman army began to you know a, a, a moment of proper crisis right that there is not the, the moment of the like the, uh, the Roman army didn't emerge from the time of Diocletian or Constantine as already forged through the third century the Constantine military reforms particularly were um, by far one of the most important and effective uh, right and until the time of uh, Valentinian the first, let's say, this military machine was uh, uh, an incredible force that coped with some, as we were saying before, some of the most aggressive enemies Rome had ever met. Like, um, if you look at the Germanic tribes uh, that the Romans had met since the Teutonic migrations, well, at this time they're much more advanced than were before, right? Uh, the Teutonic times the Germans were essentially pre-historians, right, the, uh, at the level, like, they the were barely, they were entering the Iron Age uh, at that point, um, and the, um, uh, lo loosely, right, um, the, the Alaman, the Arab Conf Germanic confederations that pressed on, on, on the, especially on the Danubian, and, of course, also Rhine borders, were becoming something much different from these scattered tribes, right, and, bands simply that still existed but now had a greater cohesion a greater motivation right they had a higher moral force to put themselves on the march and to harass the roman uh, boundaries by which they they had i mean the, the germans had been massively intimidated by the romans uh, this is something we we tend to to forget i mean the the we often mention the battle of the Teutoburg forest as if it was you know the victory of the Germans who simply, you know, uh, were passively um, taking Roman uh, oppression until they, they, they broke free, right? But the, the point is that the Germans actually entered in contact with the Roman. First of all, in fact, with the Teutonic migrations, which they invaded half of Europe, right? They went to Noricum, to Italy, to northern Spain, that they toured Gaul, and effectively uh, at the end were crushed by, by the Roman army. But at the time of Caesar as well, I mean, the official reason why the Romans entered Gaul was that the Germans were invading it, right? And they had already accomplished that, right? They had seized places like the, you know, in the areas of uh, Besançon, uh, this, um, and were threatening to, to, call, to extend in, in the west. Like, it were these waves of northerners that had basically weren't doing what, what the Celts back in the day had already done, but now the Celts is somewhat softened and the Germans were the, the, the next tough guys. Um, and, um, and the Romans, I mean Caesar specifically, uh, crushes them, 
not only he enters in Germany, slaughters an awful lot of people, the Germans freak out, um, and they stop their invasion. I mean, there are the same, the usual bans on the border, but that's very different from an entire people that, that puts himself on the march and wants to settle somewhere else. So basically up to the 3rd century, right, uh, at the end of the 2nd century, to say better, um, this thing didn't happen again, right? And even during the, the crisis of the 3rd century, yeah, these guys were pushing on the boundaries, but were still uh, repelled by the Romans. That, in order to cope with this threat, and this is just a half of the problem, they naturally had to split uh, their their forces at some point because the the continental boundaries of the empire were really were really imposing um, uh, geographically speaking, as you as you understand, it, thousands of kilometers long, and uh, the the Roman state were entering a, a pretty severe crisis due to civil wars. Um, Cope the the tide and so on. So there is this progressive um, split uh, of the uh, essentially the, the best troops of the legions that were detached when this so-called vexillationes, uh, vexillationes at the time actually, uh, in restituta, who um, were moved to kind of cope with the long-range threats, etc. And the situation wasn't just, um, I mean, from a strategical level, uh, it wasn't actually bringing Rome on the offensive. Um, it, it was essentially still leaving the initiative um, to its enemies. And that's the, the major point that is often missed, that up to Diocletian, uh, there was this um, increase, in mostly a defensivistic approach to the problem of frontiers, right? And the, the problem really, the, the thing is solved by Cr Constantine and its military reforms. Um, on the eastern frontiers of Asia, as you know, the Sassanids in the first half of the third century had replaced the Arsacids, and um, the, the Persian monarchy had began to, uh, had also had a, this re structuration, the, the reconstitution of its armed forces, also true, even in here, to Roman influence, right, uh, what was happening among the Germans, also with the adoption of weaponry and, and a better type of, you know, even tactical coordination by certain standards, was an effective Romanization, right, and the same goes for the Senates, right, the Parthians usually had sucked at siege warfare, instead the Sassanids allegedly, with the help of uh, Roman um, turncoat in, and military engineers, managed to, to provide themselves with effective artillery. With um, they, they they stabilize also in a more kind of startled direction. Um, albeit the, the Persian state is very peculiar, so it always maintains it's kind of a good half of a feudal character, right? Um, and it begins to contend the, the Near East to Rome in a much more aggressive and dangerous way than the Parthians had ever managed to do. Right, the Parthians were not quitters; definitely had never given up, but they basically failed <laughs> time after time. The Sassanids be become massive, um, a massive threat, and it's probably the greatest one. Um, possibly the greatest one and that is yet to be determined because uh, threats here are not measured just by the level of civilization but also by the sheer capacity of putting forces together right and in fact these tactical developments are also to be read in this relative terms but the Persians for example have a very strong uh, cavalry a, a, a heavy one like like the feudal society could actually provide them they had this kind of pr properly feudal system with the squires, attendants, retainers, and uh, the, the, the shock effect of the cataphract charges were pretty damn um, uh, devastating. Uh, as we know, this combined with uh, horse archery was one of the most deadly tactics at the time, but it wasn't just about that, because as we have seen, the Parthians hadn't uh, achieved more than much. Uh, everybody points out Karai, Karai, yeah, okay, Karai, but what did, what then, right, right, what did the Parthians achieve at the end? Um, and so the, the problem was now disposing of an army that could effectively cope with these threats um, without having to recur to this territorialization of uh, localization of the legions that had fundamentally 
remained stuck in their usual position, sometimes for, for hundreds of years, right? Still active, still with a very good uh, military standard and training uh, that held as long as the Roman state was effective um, all the time. Um, but that um, were not part of a of, of greater corps that could be uh, functionally uh, employed to, for example, an offensive campaign, right? The, the, the thing was done at the time. It was more a collection of all these uh, static armies uh, uh, called from all the frontiers than actually having more dynamic um, um, units uh, to, to employ strategically uh, in a much more flexible and, and effective way to cope all the threats. Let's also remember that actually the greatest foes that the Romans met ever this time were the Romans themselves, right? If you look at the civil wars themselves, they were something atrocious, and they were actually the first reason of the um, contraction of Roman society that we see at this point. Um, it's very difficult to call certain periods like the Constantinian era as moments of decline, right? And if objectively they weren't uh, such, but society was was suffering of it, like on the long run, if you look at social certification, um, inequality, um, this, this well, the, the usual system of the free, you know, the, the, the Roman citizen that served um, in the army or other uh, peregrini that simply joined the army in order to get the Roman citizen had been exhausted, um, as you know, uh, with um, the Caracalla Edict, uh, this every Roman who could speak Latin in the empire was basically, right, every subject was a Roman. And, and most of these people during the crisis of the third century were not like middle class, you know, uh, owners from which, you know, the, 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 the ancient, especially the Italic component ideally in, in the first century AD was still um, uh, providing from the, the, the majority of the, the legionary forces. Um, at this point, the Roman subjects, the Roman citizens were transforming into Roman subjects properly and becoming colonists and serving under service of, uh, of other people, right? As freemen, but uh, effectively from a contractual point of view, uh, serves, right? And um, as you know, we, we, we should talk uh, endlessly now about what Constantine did in, st strictly speaking, political and social terms. Um, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish historically because also we don't know what Diocletian did and what Constantine did um, and we usually attribute to Diocletian the fiscal and administrative reforms to Constantine the monetary and, and the military reforms uh, it's a bit blurry but I think it's pretty clear that at least from Constantinian times onwards the, the Roman military was reshaped I in a way that was very um, very different from before Right. First of all, um, Constantine, uh, the Constantinian armies we were saying before, manages to cope uh, effectively with uh, all the enemies of, of, the, of the empire were much more threatening than anything Rome had seen on its on its borders. Right. Um, the early Roman Empire didn't see major threats to Rome. Right. There were just scattered tribes uh, all around, some kingdoms that were contained or defeated. Uh, in battle, and that was it, right? There was not the major people who tried to break through, right? And especially there were enough resources for Rome to constantly uh, recruit wh whoever they wanted, right? This was the strength of the empire, the deterrent, the acknowledgement that Rome had so much wealth now when he had completed the uh, the conquest of the Mediterranean and expanded in, in, in Central uh, Europe that the Romans could even lose... Uh, multiple legions at a time this was like a very low uh, a very small loss for them and they could come up with, with many others um, and essentially uh, Constantine divided the Roman army in uh, between the domestics the scolae, the vexillationes the legiones and the auxilia right and Especially these last three corps are distinguished in Palatina and Comitatensis. The uh, legion size is reduced to 500, 1,000 um, uh, soldiers, and um, so la smaller 
units but kind of more individually deployable in this regard as consistent bodies of troops the domestics and the scholae um, constitute the unit, uh, the unit of the guard right uh, that they were practically all cavalry uh, aside from the domestici or domestici pedites um, and they had an astonishingly advanced uh, beautiful and practical equipment right that actually shows that the Roman army was very very far even from a technological decline right um, on the contrary if you really look at Roman uh, history you see that it's exactly towards the, the so-called late Roman Empire that technological um, uh, innovation is revived right because resources were less overall um, and the Romans began to invest on this more you know technical side of the story that they, they had always they had always been quite practical oh, but now they, they, they they're forced to to, to implement further because they have to ration very carefully their their resources. Now having this cavalry guard means that basically the emperor's uh, corps can be deployed much more effectively, right? They're not like the, the older Praetorians who fundamentally remained in Rome or just, yeah, I mean some uh, groups followed the, the comitatus, but essentially were not an army within the army, right? This time you have really an, a, an elite with a higher also strategical mobility and uh, the finest training and equipment. Uh, then there were still the vexillationes that were cavalry units, while the legionists and the auxilia were infantry units, uh, respectively uh, heavy and lighter, uh, heavy and light infantry. Um, and as we were saying, the palatine troops, the, the elite of the army, are equipped with excellent material. Right, they have nothing to desire to, to the previous ones, um, and uh, even the comitatensis troops were very well armed, even if they still kept using sometimes uh, older material from from previous times. Um, also, the the equipment is actually formed. I mean, m most of what you you consider to be typical of the first and second century. Um, uh, legionnaire is is to be found still in the third, like um, square um, the, the the rectangular scutum or the the pila, for example, were still there. Even the uh, the famous, uh, which is a later 17th century, I think, term, the the logica segmentata is still there. But so, in Constantinian times, things change for for like a stabilization of other transformations that had already taken place. We'll see later that. Um, you know, flatter and more oval shields, um, and the creation of other, you know, uh, lighter but uh, with higher range uh, missiles uh, rather than the pilum, and also other types of um, of, of armor. Um, we'll see this later. Then uh, there is also this other um, necessity of settling troops permanently on the frontiers. Right, this is another problem that was. Uh, essentially deriving from strategical uh, problems, but also social ones. I mean, um, now it's complicated to, to explain once again, but essentially, uh, as we've seen, the Romans in here had absorbed all the, um, the the volunteering resources, like all the peoples within the empire had been Romanized, so there weren't any proper auxilia anymore. They had to start um, searching from from. from outer from the other regions of the empire actually in the barbaricum proper um, these were people who were partly still settled but the, the problem was really now having I mean depending on external resources in part so they decide uh, also because of these raids to to concentrate their armies in the center of their armory production as we'll see towards the core lands of the empire the Mediterranean um, to have a much more direct between style administration and the recruitment, the, the armor uh, production, the weapon reproduction, um, and to just leave these local communities on the frontiers to deal with the uh, low intensity threats, like, oh, let's call them this way, albeit these, um, these new troops known as variously as Limitane, Ripensas, or Castellani, uh, didn't properly, um, I mean, they, they weren't properly. Uh, um, a field uh, army, like they, 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 but they still participated to campaigns. I mean, there were still troops that 
uh, on occasion actually were even as well equipped as the comitatensis, right? Also in this kind of stereotypical picture of the uh, uh, Limitanus as a lower standard trooper than the comitatensis is maybe on average is, is correct actually, but uh, many of these troops were also well equipped on their own. It depended on many factors, now we can't recollect them all, but just for saying what was uh, changing here. Um, and the main difference was that the Copenhagen's army represented this mobile army now. It was meant, together with the core of the Imperial Guards, to, to move across across the Roman Empire. You know, uh, that was naturally served by an excellent um, uh, uh, road system. At this time, it was already declining in part. I mean, if you look at the various um, civil wars between the Romans, I mean, going back, I mean, from, I don't know, from Britain to to Greece to to from from Gaul to uh, to Asia Minor. I mean. Um, it, it it was always like that. You realize that, that even naturally, the crisis of the third century had brought to this um, need of uh, strategic m mobility uh, of of many resources at once. That were that was an exceptional thing um, in in previous times, um, and so what, in my opinion. I, actually brings to the major transformations also in, in this army um, and at the level also of the resources that were invested for it and for the single even for the single units is that uh, naturally the empire had worn out a lot of resources there were uh, foreign and domestic threats um, the economy was contracting things were going somewhat bad there were entire provinces that were basically left um, depopulated on, 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 sometimes even on their own, depending on the situation, um, that this s s separations, at least of the, the, the ch of chunks of the empire, because of different, uh, because of revolts, uh, I mean rebellions, um, usurpations, and other splitting of of the empire, consensual splitting of the empire that always ended badly, at least until the fourth century, where you know every half was had its own problems to to mind rather than kind of fighting against each other um had unavoidably pr produced like it would happen later on also per perhaps towards the sixth century this kind of melange of troops right uh, the 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 original organic was was jumped in many ways um uh, there was an increase of foreign troops that fitted into the usual um, numeri, uh, when not federati, uh, system. Uh, there were freelance, lots of freelance mercenaries coming from across uh, the borders. There was, um, um, let's say, a, a natural hybridation happening with different military cultures, right? Especially in a moment when, the, as we've seen, the average Roman subject didn't like to participate to the army anymore, um, and was ever less called to be kind of a permanent trooper, right? So the idea, or at least, uh, let's put it in this way: when there is a civil war, major cry. Think about all the revolts, you know, times of Maximinian. Think about all the wars along the frontiers of Claudius Gothicus or uh, Aurelianus, etc. Uh, you have you you're operating as a as a commander right uh, as as a military leader with naturally a, a pool of troops you can rely on right but constantly lots of part of the empire that basically do not respond to the normal um, request I mean to to what was naturally and normally previously supplied by the state. Right, for the troops on the front, from the legions at the frontiers. So what unavoidably happens is that you have to start to operate with different resources, whether it's we're talking about actual people or materiel, and usually you're 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 in greater shortage than you were before, right? So you has also you also have to find new solutions for the equipment for and and what this did this happen for essentially because of tactical reasons, for strategical reasons. That is to say, you have to obtain the greater results um, with uh, the, the, the least effort. You would say, but w didn't in the empire happen the same way? Well, it happened in a different way. First of all, the Roman military was much better supplied at that time. Um, 
or better. There, there were many more resources that were destined um, to the maintenance of um, of certain fixed structures that basically uh, were embodied on the frontiers by the, this legionary presence that uh, had chiefly a deterrent value, right? Uh, the Romans, the, the especially on on on, on those more crowded frontiers, let's say on the Rhine of the Danube, especially they they stationed this troop, the, this legions that, as we've seen before, right, that they contained certain minor threats, but quite rarely had to deal with greater attacks, um, because these were essentially massive bulks of heavily equipped uh, infantry, supported by a plethora of lighter. Um, uh, diversely specialized uh, auxiliary troops um, and they weren't actually many right we're talking about 250,000 people and actually in the Roman Empire this numbers increased there is a huge uh, debate that now I don't want to get in to, to say what are you know who we're talking really uh, about like people who served like how do you count for example the Limitane in, in the later Roman army military, right, those were in, in, on some occasions some sort of um, territorialized militia, territorial militia, and um, even if they, they definitely could be drafted and uh, even attached to the Comitatensis, or even become Comitatensis or pseudo Comitatensis troops, um, the idea is that, yeah, that there's still a, 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 you know, that there is a still a, at least a divarication in the quality of professionalism. That is to say, the Comitatensis troops usually are uh, properly uh, what you would call the professional army, fully equipped with the best resources that uh, that can uh, move uh, on all the frontier theaters of, of the empire and, and cope effectively with it. And it is, that is conceived fundamentally for it, right? Also the strictly st strategical level. Uh, what about the rest of the troops? Like, how you count them? How much tr money do you invest? Um, this, um, the the militarization of society is, is not excessively evident, right? Because it is true you have to maintain more people, but you also have to, um, um, you have to cope with more threats, let's say, better. But how many troops were actually maintained at the time, and how much were they actually functional for? Um, um, an arm, uh, a campaign army, let's say, um, a field army, pro or mobile army. Um, this is uh, a, a discussion I don't want to get in because we'll have to concentrate on it on another video specifically. But this is just for saying that there are certain troops that destined for containment and others for, let's say, attack. Now you would say in the early empire was was it wasn't fundamentally like this well n not on a strategic on a strategic le level because this the their devil deployment was fundamentally on the frontiers right there were a few legions in the in the core lands of the empire in later on in times it's it's the other way around frontiers tend to be abandoned uh, and uh, garrisoned with um, smaller uh, units that that need basically to, to harass the enemy until the, the mobile army doesn't doesn't arrive. Sometimes they even cope with it effectively on their own. Um, but the concept is also that there is a less political social w w will to participate to the army. And that still the resources, albeit increasingly taken also from the external in, in certain situation, that is not often normal, let's say, especially from a strictly military point of view, um, are largely domestic, right? Because at this point it was not much a matter of having freelance mercenaries. Those could be found easily. The point was also tr trying to settle them and to fill those demographic gaps that had uh, formed in the provinces from, um, and, uh, and creating new subjects that could work and pay taxes, right? And occasionally, in fact, serving the army, right? But these are massive expanses, and this is a very... Uh, complex system to to put together all, all the time for a major campaign. Um, so the concept is that threats now it, are also happening all over the place. So you're not in the same condition of spending like how much you want, like a certain amount, a huge amount. Actually, the overwhelming uh, 
uh, amount of the statal expenses for the army for just remaining on the frontier. This army now has to move constantly and to cope with different threats uh, at a time. So from a strictly strategical and tactical point of view, you need troops that are functionalized for that. Right? Um, that is to say, you have less resources, but the quality of your troops have to augment. This is a bit the the the, the light motif of the late Roman Empire. Um, there is all a, a diff, a, the resuming of a certain, even ethnographical in slash strategical political thinking related to this new troop, the new peoples that uh, are on the boundaries of the empire that are very difficult to control. Um, but uh, the the idea is why would legionnaire right change in this regard? Well, first of all, there is a split um, in terms of who are we talking about, strictly speaking, as a legionnaire, because um, the idea is that all the legionnaires uh, in the past, I mean, st ideally speaking, now are so tough and heavily armored, right? And first of all, we we don't fully know what the story was. Uh, like that at the time, because the early Roman Imperial legionnaire was definitely, um, possibly, uh, this is also debatable, more covered in metal, let's say, let's put it in this way, than the late Roman legionnaire, which I I, 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 I can't assure was the case. I mean, tendentially I believe it, it is the case, but it doesn't. This still doesn't make the effectiveness of the first model. Because the the the, ha the heavily armored legionnaire in, in the early empire was fundamentally employed rarely, right? The legion in itself was a uh, w tended probably to be much more tactically autonomous than we think, right? We we don't actually know very much after all how uh, legions were I internally organized. We know of legionnaires that could perform very different tasks, even as light infantry, like even serving on horseback occasion, like that they were capable of doing a, a bit of everything. This was the ideal which the, the, the Roman legionnaire had come about. The best definition at that point is a, a, an assault engineer. That's substantially what the the early Roman imperial uh, uh, legionnaire I is, a, conceptually speaking. Um, but it, it fights preferably just in those situations in which this heavier bulk of heavy infantry is can find its better employment. Most of the military operations were actually carried out by the auxiliaries that were fundamentally similar in in essence to what we see is, is the average of the late Roman legionnaire. I explained myself better. Of course there were certain auxiliaries who were kind of raw Right, we know during the year of the four emperors that were German auxiliaries that still wore fours and you no know, armor. Right, this, this stereotypical thing also Roman sources like to emphasize that came in Rome, right, to to fight in in the civil war. But the um, the, the point is that the auxiliary units that were becoming thanks to Augustus' regularization, albeit maintaining originally their ethnical. Uh, specialties, let's put it in this way, were increasingly looking like legionnaires. And actually, even in here, the myth that the legionnaires were fundamentally just that type of trooper and that the auxiliary was, was just stereotypically a lighter one, do not hold, right? There is no um, absolute evidence for this. Like, w there is a, a, an evidence that shows definitely the this difference originally speaking but the more times passes this is less obvious and if the auxiliary troops had to fight at one point it's it's partially we know actually that they use the the same exact legionary equipment at least that it was available to them probably in less um, quantity right um but um we we can say that um the also, the supplying system was was structured in, in such a way to categorically uh, separate and standardize these types of troops. Right? It was not achievable, and we have actually, yeah, the, the segmentata even in uh, auxiliary force. Um, the, it, there is nothing surprising about it, right? Because if you look at every single war has ever been fought, every single military system has ever been created, this hybrid. Uh, this interchangeability has always been there, right? And, and why should we uh, 
uh, have this war gaming uh, prejudices to say no, the, the, these troops always fought exclusively in this way, and the rest does not exist ever. Right? It's simply stupid. Right? Um, secondly, um, the the same thing here must happen in the late Roman Empire within the same. I mean, the, the same Roman records, right? Because interestingly enough, um, as you know, the, aux the auxiliary early on were, were foreigners, and naturally in the late Roman Empire were still auxiliaries, sometimes from the same regions bordering the empire. Think about the, Mar uh, the Mauritanian horsemen, or uh, the Germanic um, uh, infantry, right? And this keeps going on, and the Roman army, by the way, is, is an incredible Romanizer um, at this point. Uh, it, it doesn't get barbarized. It's the barbarians that get Romanized. It, it's the other way around. But the uh, one of the most important changes in here is that now the Roman army is able to structure itself with, with a military of Romans that is effectively trained in all the those various specialties that, albeit in part revived by this injection of auxiliaries, is is still basically perf performed by by the same subjects in the fashion the, the, the older auxiliaries were doing. So if you... all this thing is important, was important as a premise to, to explain why you see in late Roman times to if you just base yourself on the individual soldier this apparent uh, lightening of, of the equipment. Now is this um, absolutely true? Uh, in my opinion, yes. But once again, it, it may be actually very uh, tricky in the sense that what you see, uh, to make it brutal, among the Comitatenses and the Limitane in the late Roman Empire is actually not different from what you can see uh, in between the, the legionnaires and the auxiliaries in the early Roman Empire. Right? And, and the late Roman Empire, as we were saying, is, is coming all from Rome, right? from, yeah, from the Empire. Right? This is interesting. Um, naturally, lots of, of foreigners serve as well, right? So there are there is an important um, transformation in the equipment that definitely shows signs of a uh, an, an external influence. But even about this, we should be very careful because even in here, what's in internal and external, right? Uh, certain weapons that we character uh, stereotypically attribute, for example, to to the Germans, like the the Frankish, Frankish Franziska, it seems to have been actually um, a Roman invention. Uh, like the 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 Romans did use their axes, and it seems that the Franciscas might have evolved, as a matter of fact, from Roman axes, and uh, not the other way around. Um, the general, even about the Roman swords. Uh, we will have to talk about this all in detail at one point, but are we sure, actually, that the Gladius was the first Roman sword, even in early Roman Empire, right? We we know, of course, that the legionary infantry uh, usually fought, like, like his primary weapon was overwhelming the Gladius, that also has different types, uh, it has its own evolution. But what about the cavalry swords, and how much do we if we think they we we know actually that the spate were spate were much more spread it was longer weapons um of apparently latin uh, derivation this is celtic influence that's also what the germans basically begin to keep uh, with when they see is the, the former uh, celtic um, inhabited areas by the way during the late roman empire also the the main metallurgic centers in europe shift from noricum to the middle rhine valley so also the germans um but actually and more the the sarmatians these peoples of the eurasian steppes uh introduce important um metallurgical skills that uh, actually, they were very evenly matched by, by the Romans themselves. Like there is a huge debate we, which had the best metallurgy. We will have to talk about this in detail once uh, in another video. But let's say that all in all, there wasn't much of a difference. But uh, even the spata, right, is is not this huge deal because if you look what the Roman gladius actually emerged from, like we, I don't know why we have to think of the Roman gladius as a dagger, right? Surely 
it was a, they weren't ex very long swords, and they they also tended at some point to to shorten and to have this long uh, shorter reach. But if you look at where that the the sword emerges from, and also it's progressive, like look at the mines or Pompeii types, for example, as a, a difference that is quite uh, meaningful be between the same types of of gladi. For, um, you'll see that essentially the gladius did stem from Latin swords as well, right? That uh, they taken from the Celtiberians actually in Spain, um, and uh, back in the third century BC, uh, and uh, even previously, like there weren't so many. Like the gladius came once again to fit a, a tactic rather than being a sword on its own, and the Romans actually made. If you look at especially the the the, the early Roman gladi, they're actually pretty long beasts. We think that the gladius is just, uh, you know, a, um, you know, a piercing weapon, right? Uh, it is a stabbing weapon that doesn't 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 see the potential in that sword. And in some of the longest months of the early days, you can see up to the late Republic, they're actually not very sh much shorter than a spata. Those were freaking choppers. Like ask the, the Macedonians at at Pydna, right? limbs cut off, right, it was extremely gruesome, uh, ancient warfare was plain butchery, literally nothing else, um, the, so the spada was always around among Roman cavalry, and we can presume easily among Roman infantry, and how much does this m kind of iconic picture of the legionnaire with the, sh with the dagger, the Lordica segmentata, and the, the rectangulars couldn't happens literally for probably the shortest time of Roman military um, types right it's a very limited thing and it always coexisted all around with aside from the fact with with same Roman legionaries as far as we know could be equipped easily and we know it from literally the whole iconographical evidence and archaeological evidence for, from the early Roman Empire with very different weapons oval shields longer swords um, lances of all type I mean Let's be serious about this. Very different helmet types and um, even cuirasses, etc. But also with this plethora of auxiliaries that all have their kind of their different equipment, and they're largely, as far as we see, lancers, right? Um, which is what the average Roman legionnaire, actually in the late Roman Empire, comes to be uh, substantially, right? Um, and even in here, it, the, the whole thing would require a, a great oblological reflection that we will do when we will talk specifically about the single weapons and why these changes occurred but uh, overall just to make you understand what we're talking about in here um, you have to conceive the the early Roman in, imperial um, legionnaire and this is a, a prejudice that we still have it's very difficult to 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 focus it properly as not this absolutely Gregor uh, Gregarian, we can say, that fights exclusively in information, right, and, and that out of it is lost. Actually, the Roman um, warrior type, right, the descends from the Italic infantries of, uh, you know, of the previous centuries, is fundamentally an individualistic, individualistic minded fighter, right? He is drilled now, he's disciplined, because the, the Roman state has repressed violently the um, uh, warlike individualism uh, in the actual fight. But uh, in the mindset, the, the, this, the, the drill has just channeled it, actually, to within some boundaries. And what the, the, the Roman legionary is, is technically, essentially, a guy who fights on his own. Right, there is an enormous debate in this. Not because effectively, the, I mean, I, I don't want you to get me wrong. Um, the, the legionnaire did fight information; was best fitted to fight information. But this formation doesn't in, in, entail by itself necessarily this uh, thick, uh, thickly compact, uh, let's say rugby-like uh, type of fight. Right, but rather. Uh, a broader di space dimension where where the legionnaire can express freely his individualistic um, uh, tensions um, in an effective way, right? If you look at the scutum, for example, in the iconic rectangular one that we actually don't know when and and and, and how like was was used practically, right? Uh, 
whether, for example, it was ever the, the majority one. Uh, if you look at the most iconographical evidence, it, we know that th there is a doubt about this, that m most of the Roman propaganda of the time, especially if you look at the Trajan column, um, and wants to show this 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 prototype of legionnaire just become the most famous, right? The the, the iconic um, Roman legionnaire is is the propa propagandistic Trajanic uh, one, Trajanic one of, of of the column. Uh, but uh, let's assume it it is it, it was even the majority mode because it could even be that at some point it was at, uh, around that point, of course, but. If you look at the rectangular shield, it fundamentally is fitting for inserting a people a person inside, right? Um, the more uh, the the shield is concave, right, and the more it is conceived for an individualistic uh, fancy. Why? Because essentially you can't. I mean, there is no way to 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 join this uh, shield with someone else. When you have flatter shields, actually, those are the best ones for overlapping with each other, forming the, the shield walls, the, the full con that you can see easily as a, you know, kind of a characteristic, um, let's call it formation or array, uh, let's say mm, order, let's say better, than the, um, uh, the, 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 of the late Roman uh, infantry, right? Um, and you can see in, in conceptually in this that if the flatter shield is for effectively creating a shield wall in a kind of solid defensive wall position, the, the concave shield is meant for that guy to go relatively out in its own space, um, even if sighted by other troops, to actually chop, uh, to, to most mostly stabbing, it is true, but also slicing and other doing other movements, cutting behind the nape, hence the, the larger neck guard of the uh, typical Italic and Gallic, and Gallic helmet types, um, and or slicing their, their tendons of, of, of by kneeling um, on the, you know, uh, behind the, the legs, this, you know, passing behind, like embracing, like it's a very physical uh, fencing, the adversary uh, stabbing in, in the neck, in the armpits, like where are, there are important blood vessels that you know, you can to which you, if you wound, you can easily uh, bleed your your enemy to death um, uh, with, uh, and um, and therefore what what seems like a much more aggressive and individualistic attitude, right? Not that once again the early Roman imperial legionnaire was a barbarian. Uh, as we can e imagine stereotypically, the, the Romans were coming from because that was their their obsession. The Romans don't don't ever think, don't make the silly mistake of considering the Romans and and their military culture stemming from a, a republican, democratic, uh, citizen soldier ideal. The Roman model was uh, one of the most brutal things ever seen in a civilized um, so society. That was essentially the one of the warrior. Right, uh, it was the Roman army was effectively an aristocratic army where the aristocrats led the, the masses of the people, and had this enormous warlike ethos that uh, that that was lacking from other. If you part of the success of the Roman military culture derives from this extremely aggressive mindset, um, and this works why? Because well, it's kind of complex to explain once again, but let's say the Romans come largely from that warlike, almost barbarian, Italic substratum that, that is still up to the first century AD is in their veins, right? That's what the, the, the Rome is, is still emanating, the Italy is still emanating this kind of its own military version of, of, of the world, right? The, the, this um, great demographic and economic strength that, that is the channel in this, in this um, process of Romanization that passes Definitely through exploiting the uh, tribal, um, violent, um, individual, uh, you know, warlike mindset of, of, of the Italic warrior. Then this thing, cold and this kind of uh, cools down over time because the Italians gentrify and they don't want to fight anymore. There are other peoples that weren't there. The Gauls, um, uh, the, the later in the third century, the Illyrians famously. Um, and, and the problem is also about this that that is really, uh, uh, according to me, uh, an important social and cultural thing that also remains in other, in, in the Middle Ages, should be studied more because it, it's a, an interesting key of interpretation that these populations partly lose their combativity, right? And it's, it's 
it's it's really a matter of literally if if you can't live a better life you you do not go out there to make even a living in the military right um so we often forget how primitive the ancient world still was right and how we 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 think about, we talk about Rome the late republic early empires if now we had reached the peak of civilization and eventually one day we lost during the middle ages and then we re- recovered in in the late in the last centuries but that word was primitive as hell, right? Uh, the, the word is aristocracies were more or less elevated, but the, the majority of the masses was still in, in a mindset we would find quite quite different from the, the you know a modern thinking of, of even a way of life. Um, so what happens brutally d- d- during the third century is is that this um, you know the, this fun you know that that what had made Rome expansive as an empire um, effectively runs out in terms of resources I mean it's not a huge drama as we think it, it, it's more dramatic for what in the way that it brought the consequences within the Roman uh, political and institutional culture once again it's, it's chiefly the Romans that start destroying the empire on their own uh, rather than the others the others just take advantage of it uh, but Rome is still the big thing, right? There's no other power that can compare. It's literally, it, 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 Rome really rules the world at this point, right? As I often say, the, this is, it doesn't matter that, that it wasn't the whole world, because who cares in the third century what's the world world? They, they, they barely knew that. Uh, Rome literally conquered the world world, and also no people escaped in this regard, because it doesn't mean anything that there were certain peoples who were not directly under... Uh, the legions, right? But they were still gravitating around the empire. I mean, Rome was literally the greatest thing ever. They knew about it in places that Rome that didn't even know of their existence, right? Rome was known in the Urals, in Scandinavia, and the Romans barely gave a damn about them. Uh, they didn't even know Russia existed at the time, geographically speaking. Um, and the the interesting thing about this is is that Rome, all of a sudden, must basically reinvent a, a form of uh, political and military organization that, that should be effective, um, should be functional, and they manage that. Like, Constantinian reforms in this regard are the uh, astonishing success of that model. And this model, um, from a, as we have seen, a, a political, social, strategical, and tactical point of view, to pass to the individual equipment, passes, essentially, through the uh, chiefly... Um, Increase on uh, uh, Tolkien's. Let's say, let's let's stick to the equipment since the, the video is theoretically about this. To the tactical interaction, right? As we were saying before, the the early Roman imperial heavy um, legionnaire wasn't uh, the legionnaire as a heavy infantry wasn't employed out of just pitch battles and storming uh, citadels. Like, look at Mazada. Look at waddling straight, like you know, concentrating the enemy at one point and battering down like like animals. Like that's what the Roman legionnaire has to do, and believe me, he is perfect at that. Right? There is nothing that can match up there. Right? Even if uh, in that specific tactical formula, though, that is this massive block of uh, of intensely and brutally and violently drilled infantry that basically acts like a steam roller in front of wh- whatever they find in front of them. That they are um, uh, what most people out there can't cope with, because uh, barbarian armies normally are uh, numerous, but they're they're uh, they're not very heavily armored, right? They're just their elite, their aristocracy can do. Rome has massive uh, intercontinental supplying systems. It's a beast of of of. Economic power and resources, and it can f- supply its troops with some of the finest equipment to to imp- like confer them the, this years and years of training, which is massive and massive resources, just for one ultimate end that is to pass over these people and cutting them to pieces, right? Until they're o- that they finish, right? In, until there is no nobody else to butcher, right? And this didn't even stop at the the fighting troops this you know it's beyond look at waddling street uh, you know even women and children because let's be honest about that that was the world that time 
Uh, the others didn't do literally anything better. That was the norm, the rule. Um, and these guys knew how to do it better than everybody else. Like, this is the point. Like, if you really want to, to compare this thing morally, think that this is a world of butchers and murderers, of rapists, of enslavers. This is a world's big slave system. Why are the Roman better in absolute terms if you were to compare them as a civilization? So everybody butchers people. Here the, the, the value stands in how intelligent you are to butcher them better than others. Right, that, that's the best civilization. Of course, it's, Rome is much more than this. Also, the barbarian tribes were much more than this. But it got down to that because that was the, their way of doing it. Right, Rome was killed more people, let's, let's put it in this way, just because it was a more advanced civilization, not because it was morally worse than the others. On the contrary, right? It also left something out of this as an option to join, after all, the Roman system, not just to, to be butchered. Um, when she wanted, right? And but others didn't offer the same, uh, the same chance. The what I'm trying to say in here is that the legionnaires could do this only when the auxiliaries had paved them the road for it, for doing this. So the the auxiliaries uh, uh, took the, the 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 burden of the heaviest and most ferocious and fer and and fierce and bloody encounters. Of what concerns skirmishings, skirmishing, um, raiding, um, ambushing, I mean, all those things that, ro that the legionnaires technically could do, but they were not mm, wasted for. Because what do you employ, like a heavy infantry for skirmishing, for scouting, for foraging, for... Sometimes they did that, right? If There, there are many accounts of that, but when the auxiliary system becomes uh, standardized with Augustus uh, as a permanent system, uh, the thing was aimed exactly at that. Now, in the late Roman Empire, finally, the Romans couldn't do this, right? They, they could use the barbarians often to do the, the dirty job, which they continued to do. But still, they needed, now, in battle, a much more effective tactical system, because most of the times they didn't have enough resources, in absolute terms, to invest um, uh, at a strategic level, either than their field armies. So these field armies now couldn't be just about the heavy infantry. Uh, they would have suffered tremendously, right? Heavy infantry in itself is not a you know like a tank that you have to knock down, uh, you know, with with super weapons. It's literally something that you surround. If you surround, if you block retreats, you you can't easily annihilate in the same way. Um, other, the, the enemies are starting to have something similar. I mean, the Germans are not as as armored, uh, as well armored as Roman legionaries. But let's say that the gap now is is uh, thinning down, um, and actually, the Germans have developed also this heavy javelins like the Babre or the Angon that are actually not, or the Saint Franciscus that are basic. They have basically the same degree of penetra uh, penetrability of the Roman pilum. They're they're thrown in this. Um, all at once before the charge, and in Germanic charges, infantry charges are devastating, right? And the Roman infantry has to cope with that as well. Uh, has to cope with the combined uh, tactics of the Persians, heavy cavalry plus horse, horse archery, that are that you can't engage uh, like um, at close range, right? The, you can't do something with the pila, maybe, but you you have to respond with artillery, with arrow fire. So progressively. Uh, the tendency is to integrate all these tactical specialties in, in a single army. That is the comitatensis, but it is the, the, the field army proper. Which means what exactly? It means that you have to train your troops to rain best money in a different way. You have to teach these people to basically operate with all the single kind of weapons of arms uh, in in combined tactics, right? Um, it's nothing like the early legionnaire that stood there, waited for the the assault, and then did it. It was just a, mostly a frontal thing to 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 slaughter what they had in the front. It was brutal as that. They were heavily armored for that to to go in the midst of the fray, uh, to to just stab, stab, stab. They were 
rough uh, as hell, but they, tactically speaking, like they, they were very intensely drilled, but, and, and they knew how to, to swap formations uh, from the line of battle, how to, um, to, to maintain discipline, etc. But after all, their task on the field was, was fairly simple, right? They didn't have to hyper-concentrate, and that was the actually very effective to do, because if you have auxiliaries, why do you have to hyper-specialize your infantry to do something else, right? This time, this is not possible anymore. You have at least to use same Roman troops that did what the, the auxiliaries did before. And now, demographic resources are also tighter. So you can't lose all of these people. You can't... They are Roman, Roman subjects, right? It's also a political thing. You can't send them then to, to, to the mid-grinder just because they're auxiliaries, right? Before, they were foreigners. What the freak cares about them? Let themselves get, getting killed to, to, to get to the citizenship, right? While let's preserve our Roman citizen uh, legionaries. Uh, this, this is a whole different thing. And you have to cope now with enemies that are even more more aggressive, more tactically effective. So you understand immediately from this premise that whatever the Romans managed to form in the 4th century, by the 4th century, to defeat Sasanians, Alamanni, Goths, whatever, it was an enormously effective machine. Right, you say gods, oh well Adrianople, right yeah, it, it's mostly to Valentin the first the system works well, but even if you look at a battle of Adrianople, there is nothing um you know, tactically uh, infamous aside from the chain of command. Like the the Roman uh, the Romans basically uh, got themselves battered t t till the end. I mean they were they, were, they showed a, an astonishing quality of their military and the the main problem with Adrianople was all what would evolve like uh, in a very far perspective, right? Because even at that point, it's not that the Visigoths entering in the Roman Empire were a greater problem by themselves than others, right? It's also how they were handled. As we know, the Visigoths could be easily wiped out two or three times with, you know, with, with Stilico, and it wasn't done for a specific political aim. So you can't impute that to, to the failure of the Roman army. Adrianople wasn't the beginning of no end, because the Roman Empire ended more than 1,000 years later, right, so we have to reconsider a lot of things that today are actually historiographically well known, but that some people have still difficulty to to acknowledge. Um, so, basically, this this system, how, how did it work in the field, right? Um, the um, First of all, the weapons that were provide the troops that were provided with were multiplied, and the training required, necessary one, is 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 increased, right? Um, troops are at this point really trained to to use a great set of, of weapons, uh, and that are not just once again it's it's the weapon, it's the tactical specialization in in units that makes the difference. Uh, this passage is not so radical as we, we can imagine, right? It's mostly an organic um, transformation of the army that makes the difference. Uh, infantry, for example, remains the, f the most important arm. Yes, cavalry had increased in, ha had acquired more importance, but like uh, we also tend to, to, to under-evaluate in, in previous times how cavalry wa was important after all. Um, and so let's pass, for example, to helmets. Helmets get cheaper, famously in Tarchisa types of the third century, right? They, they were the skull caps uh, mounted in halves in two pieces and close in the middle um, that probably betray some Eastern evil influence, but it's just about, I mean, how differently can be uh, helmets done, right? But the the towards from the second half of the third century especially you see that this hyper um you know specialized kind of uh, always more enclosing and protective helmets evolving from the earlier types uh, basically uh, disappear all of the sudden right they were becoming always more enclosing covering the the the, the cheeks did um like even more protective than they had ever been but it basically disappear all of the sudden like th what does this mean practically well it it means practically there was a a, a great 
uh, change of direction even in the resources that were provided with the arm right if you have a sniper uh, increase of the elite as you can see with the uh, employment what you can see w with the vexillationes for example you see that, that the best troops were chosen and therefore were also better equipped so you find those types of of helmets developing in the early third century right like they neither, neither be but the, those things like that um, if you're from the second half of the third century you see that overwhelmingly everything passes to a cheaper model that is uh, it, it has obviously less protection but is still effective in some form you realize that something has changed importantly and what you see in parallel tactically speaking is that infantry has increased for example is missile power that the it, that basically keeps the fight more distant for many legionnaires uh, that in this regard do not have to be even excessively protected and the roman administration from from the morning and say that with that cheaper armor can save from that cheaper armor can invest in something else right uh, for example in more organic and uh, specialized bodies of cavalrymen as we've seen for especially for the guards and also as we were saying before that there are the uh, fabrica, fabricae of state these armories that are scattered especially uh, as we've seen the core lands of the empire and that there is no sign of private um, uh, armories like it happened before right it actually the Roman army well, wasn't so centralized in administration before like there were private conventions for the army for providing supply armament but also the legionnaires produced mm, importantly uh, uh, weapons and armor on their own uh, in, the, in their legionary camps um, and now the whole thing is also mon monopolized by the state there is this political need to take away from the provinces much of their uh, autonomy um, in terms of military control because they, they f the the emperors feared uh, rebellions as uh, user patients right and they they kept their uh, resources much more secure on the great fortified cities of the Mediterranean um, and um, this is an advantage right um, and so once again wh what it has also to work in here is like the this um, for example, from the helmets, this uh, lightening uh, of of the type, kind of, um, uh, let's say, a bad thing. Like, how can you judge just that uh, that variable as what matters, right? Leaving aside, there were other type of helmets, like the Berkasova ones, like the 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 Spangenhelm, uh, right, and others that were actually worn especially by the comitatensis troops that were much more um probably much more practical uh, than uh, even the, the earlier italic and, and gallic types because they they seem at least if you look at them they, they seem to be much somewhat more compact um also slightly more at anatomic right and they they look much more like cavalry helmets in fact used by the same sermations uh in certain cases spangenhelm uh is meant to, to have come from this broader area of the near middle east and the the eurasian steppes um were uh, where cavalry was a much more f um, intense thing these guys are fighting uh m more ever more uh on horseback but they're also legionaries on their own they, they often fight dismounted as well um so this type of helmet seems to be more practical and um to offer a good degree of protection for from most uh, hits is not so sophisticated but it, it, it's probably more effective um, and it um, it does its work right um, so even in here the comitatensis troops actually don't have a blighter equipment at the early times but it's still something different from the new challenges that they have to, to meet um, this fact is the reason a relatively abandonment of the neck guard in part um, of those broad ones at least in the Gallic and Italic types why well probably because in, in the individual fencing really there was not that f enormous physicality anymore tactics had increased mostly on, on cooperation between uh, among the various arms so it was mostly the, the unit shock effect that, that, that was important rather than the individual grabbing that could happen very often among the legionnaires even themselves during civil wars right uh, 
needed that very very intense physical contact while uh, while in, um, fighting in the front line uh, so there are still heavy troops who take the burden of the fight but also lighter troops they evenly do something else but this stereotype of the lightning of the Roman army passes often through this I would say imprudent but also widespread uh, interpretation of a passage of Bajetsus that as you know is probably the, the most important f uh, source of, of, of especially for the 4th century and um, according to to Vom f since the reign of Gratian onwards that is from 367 383 the soldiers um, having according to him and he had an agenda for writing this um, uh, had basically needed less training they began to wear less helmets and, cur and, and cuirasses uh, because of, of their weight now Vegetius first of all was is misinterpreted because he said himself he didn't understand anything about military stuff he didn't have much of a great military experience on his own right he admits that first of all secondly it's one of the of the few sources that talk specifically about such things and the ideal in his work is to say okay uh, in the earlier empire everything was beautiful right and now things have gone worse right so he's suffering also of some legitimate um, you know uh, complaint of, of think that we were going worse by certain standards and he is trying to make sense of why apparently uh, r the Roman armies had less uh, armor than before and his idea is uh, they're wearing less armor because they're less trained and they they don't want to uh, wear them anymore like what does it mean uh, the, the literally the first thing that everybody does in battle even if it does have any uh, training is, is to protect himself especially this head right so this idea that helms and armor uh, their armor didn't uh, really have uh, even uh, they weren't even worn in some cases that doesn't quite make make sense by the slightest um, and especially for their weight right what's the deal here like it's that they were lazy or there was no discipline in the sense that they let them not to wear it well, what the hell does it mean let's be honest about it about uh, hundreds of thousands of troops that were trained and equipped in and fought continuously in these uh, in these centuries. What what does it even mean, right? Um, and what Vegetius should be rather interpreted like more healthily is simply meaning that there was more light infantry included in the army, right? But th the abandonment of armor doesn't make sense. Is this logical? Is partial, right? Uh, and um, and as we have seen, actually, the Roman army this time had some of the finest uh, armor ever ever displayed. Um, and as we have seen, this armor was usually produced in the Stadal armories, right? Between the third and the fourth century, we see this um, greater employment of the um, Lorica Yamatai and Squamatai, right? Uh, that are essentially the the, uh, the chain mail and fish scale kind of um, armor that is basically what legionnaires had worn since ever basically because there are two types that exist since our, the archaic Roman army and no uh, the, 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 the squamata was not like introduced later because the Romans arrived on the Persian frontier no uh, those things were present in Italy since ever we are at the time of Rome was was born right um, and um, the same goes for chain mail many people say well there, there is slighter evidence maybe like actually there's a lot of evidence of armor from this time but we don't understand we see a greater variety right and uh, some have even started to say that there were probably maybe some leather uh, armor uh, like with um, in boil leather that was kind of less flexible than chain mails and squamata squamata um, and uh, but there's not much of evidence actually from the armories producing leather armor in this regard leather armor actually always existed throughout this time it just, just wasn't widespread like in the middle ages like there was a few of it and it was surely used but um, we 
we also have difficulties to assess whether, first of all, archaeologically, normally organic material is not to be found uh, because it wears out. And also, in iconographically speaking, we, we don't know what, what material are, uh, materials are represented in these, in these uh, equipments. But anyhow, um, that's a bit of a um, useless uh, thing because we know, we have plenty of evidence, that the, the level of armoredness remained substantially the same for the heavy infantrymen, right? Just there were more, uh, there were lighter infantrymen that used less of it, but there were also lighter troops that needed that speed, that um, less weight on the field, right? So, perfectly fine. And actually, we find a consistent number of, e of iconographical evidence that show um, uh, a neat um, tendency to the lengthening of the extremities of the of the cuirass for the protection of um, knees and elbows, right? So there is actually this sense. Um, in, in some case, even the, the armor comes to protect the the head, like a sort of uh, cap of hood. Um, is very interesting. There from the Dura Europa's frescoes and from the Virgilius Vaticanus. There, there is evidence of this. Um, the there is also a, a greater spread of the Lorica squamata as, as such, um, and especially among the, the officers, like as it had been already before. There are also, as we were saying before, this Lorica musculata that we don't understand whether it's metal or leather sometimes, and they're less flexible, and also in here, like in the past, it had been a prerogative of officers usually, right? We don't know much. I mean, sometimes you, you find even soldiers represented with them, but hey, yeah, they could literally wear everything, but it seems that at least they weren't so so widespread in this regard. But actually, the tendency here is the rather the increase of the level of protection, right? And especially this comes from the a bit the cliche, but it's not wrong that in the during the migration era, a lot of I mean, there is a a, a sensible increase of stuff flying around during battles, right? The, the the idea of the increase of missile fire in several armies is quite evident. I mean, the Romans increase it. Uh, the Sassanid Persians intensify that because even if they were, you know, already traditionally uh, like using it, the Germans do it as well, as we've seen with the heavy javelins. So the idea of increase of protection. Um, also having this broader shields, right, this, as we'll see now, this r larger shields is still kind of oval, but kind of also expanding the surface that was actually uh, presented in front of the enemy, uh, suggests that um, the, the Roman army itself was under much heavier fire, right, and wh whatever you, you, you interpret this like, you have always to think that if the Roman army is getting uh, better protection, uh, it's not just being more offended, but it's going to be more offensive in itself because, as we have seen very often, the Romans fight against the same Romans. So that's a need that actually might have even uh, increased during time of civil wars. During the third century, even the fourth century was was pretty brutal uh, in many ways, um, and uh, with also with invasions, of course, um, and 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 this had become kind of. Uh, more main in earlier times, objectively, this enormous missile, intense missile fire might have been maybe downsized a little bit by the sources, but at least from effectively the, the study of of those times panoplies, it seems that missile fire was less intense than late Roman times. Like the idea that during, mi during the migration era, there's a lot more of peoples coming from the east. It's either the Middle East, uh, usually actually the steppes proper. That poor also in uh, you know in uh, in other regions, and that bring together with them this great deal of horse archery. That also the Romans tend to imitate at this point. That they imitate cataphracts, right? Um, and in fact, it, it's pretty evident that most of this lamellar, I mean, uh, at least a sound amount of lamellar choruses is a typical Eastern origin. Right, uh, it's very evident, especially if you compare them with the cataphract uh, cavalry that you can find uh, in the graffitis of the Europas. There are good examples of that, um, and we can go as far as saying that actually, what you s normally see as the cataphract panoply could be used even by some infantrymen, right? Which is something you rarely see actually on the field, but 
uh, I mean, even in iconography and even in art, modern artworks that kind of open you to these ideas, it was actually possible. And, you know, the, this armor was made up in the usual way. I mean, the, the, the lamellae were mounted on on this um, s substratum, right, with um, leather straps and a textile support. I mean, yeah, that's how you, you had this lamellar stuff. Um, and for what concerns the uh, the band uh, plate armor, like the Lorica Segmentata, right, that, well, we, we have it... Um, up to the end of the third century, actually right around there, not not much beyond the the mid third century, to be honest. But there's still something around. This um, armor was also re recycled in some ways, uh, as material is becoming um, uh, you know rarer. So this stuff was metal, was good, was solid, but it's definitely being abandoned this time as a type of armor, and the and what remains actually from that type of band armor is are the manikai the manikai for the um arms and similar protections for for the legs that are especially spread among cavalry because as you understand the cavalry man is more directly exposed on horseback especially to arrow fire i mean to to missile fire but not only and has less chances to to defend it's not in a shield ball, it's not in a... it's exposed, well, even at, on, on, even in a higher position. Um, and there are other... Um, that the, the, there were also this um, kind of padded armor under the metal one, the Toro Comacos, right, this kind of... in fact, this cloak stuffed with a bull or felt, and covered in, in leather that used to be worn beneath the cuirass properly meant. Uh, it, some actually also in later centuries you see were worn uh, over the cuirass, but that's another, at least I don't think there is much direct evidence of this in late Roman times proper. There were other leg protections like the Ocrae or the Ocridia, uh, depending whether it's Latin or Greek you prefer. Um, and they're prescribed but by Vegetius also later on by the strategic one, right? So it's actually rather an increase, right? We we have seen that usually this uh, hemming of the metal protections, or especially the manichae and then sometimes even the, the, the leg protection proper, um, increased during the Dacian Wars uh, under Trajan, just because in the Trajan column we find some of these. But... This could be a broader evolution from, right, uh, the same threats that were partly met on the eastern frontier, right? There, there is no teleological connection between this and others, right? There, there are a lot of misconceptions regarding this, um, even from which these specialties actually came from in, in terms of equipment, right? What we often depict as the Levantine Syrian auxiliary archers actually might have had a typical equipment with this kind of cap point, from that is very similar to the ones of some of the areas of the Balkans or the, the Sarmatians, right? Uh, similar to the Spangenhelm that is uh, adopted also in, in 14th century, and and after all, the Near East and and Sarmatia, those areas are, have much more in common that is usually credited, especially through the Persian Channel. Like the, the, they were pr pretty close people. Also in the Caucasus, that there was a lot of influence from many military cultures, Sarmatians, Persians, etc. Now, another very important uh, element in here that we have discussed partly before is, is, is also the shield, right? Um, the, the, the myth, as we've seen, that the rectangular shield was the, uh, the, the, the most, uh, it was the, the majority uh, type uh, during even previous times is, is devoid of a historical foundation, right? We have no evidence whatsoever, not even one, that the Roman army was equipped regularly with rectangular shields. Um, uh, I mean, it, as a standard shield. Um, the same goes for the Lorica Segmentata, whatever, but we have seen how it is. From the 3rd century, like from the second half of the 2nd century, you can easily see, um, for example, from the Antonine column, armies of Marcus Aurelius, I mean, literally all the Roman shields depicted in it, and it's freaking many, um, 
are round or uh, are oval or round, preferably oval, right? Um, but they're not rectangular, right? And we're talking about the time of Marcus Aurelius. Um, and there is no doubt that since the third century, the most common type of shield in the Roman army is undoubtedly the oval one, right? And um, this is evident from the main, the greatest part of iconographic evidence, right? And um, it's also important based on the very important find of the of the shields of Dura Europas that are dated to the mid third century. Um, there is a, a rectangular scutum among them as well. They're also pretty large and round ones. Also, I put here some examples in the first part of the video. And they're pretty high. Like, they're usually between um, 100, 120 centimeters uh, tall and the width of 95 centimeters. The thickness is between 8 and 12 millimeters, right? And externally, um, the shield was covered with a leather and internally by linen and the external margin that usually got corroded, I mean consumed was protected by another frame of leather right of rough leather so that that had to be consumed in that sense it was actually sewn through a series of, of holes that was that were possibly created on the, on the shield and, and the and there are circular shields Right, the, the, that are uh, adopted both by infantry and cavalry, as you can see, exam for example, on the arcs of Galerius and of Constantine. And this is very interesting because um, you see that the, the round shield is spreading among troops known as the Lanciari, right, that are actually skirmishers, right. And it's fascinating because uh, these are legionaries proper. They're a bit like the Velitas in Roman times. Remember those that disappear roughly around the time of the Marian reform? Well, they, they come back essentially like this, uh, with the difference that they're a bit as light infantry, sometimes they're also very well equipped. So there was sometimes an elite skirmishing infantry among the 4th century Roman army that we don't have evidence of for. Uh, like that probably existed also in previous Roman times, like according to the, the, the occasion, but uh, here it was getting functional and regularly. Um, present in uh, functionally regularly present in the organic of the of the legion. This is very very important, and we have several evidence of all this. Now we skip it. We will look at at it in many other videos. That as we have said before, and uh, we have um, f for late Roman times, as you well know, and I made a, a video about this with all the shield patterns. Uh, this um, documentation that is the Notitia Dignitatum um, that derives from later manuscripts uh, in the Middle Ages that however shows basically for it, it's actually a composed time between the 4th and the 5th century um, all the uh, unit shield patterns of the various uh, of, all, of all the Roman armies uh, Roman units that were stationed uh, in uh, across the Empire and naturally, you know, we have to take it a bit as with uh, cum grano salis, let's say, because it's still a mediated source, but uh, it's pretty eloquent because it tells us that at least at that time, in a regular base, units had uh, their shields painted uh, with the insignia, right, of their own of their own unit and and it probably was like that also before it's just we have much less evidence I, I made a video about this if you go all this stuff is in the Roman um, Roman army playlist we made a video just uh, I think a month ago about the the unit the unit shield patterns in the early Roman army that we don't have a, a great um, I mean for the early Imperial armies we have don't have a great evidence for but I mean at least in 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 the, there is a, an enormous evidence, but they're not of a um, direct, uh, systematic one, and this is also mm, particularly meaningful because it, it's not that we know a lot about the Roman army in itself. Like if it, it wasn't for the Notitia de Nitato manuscript, we would be wandering even for late Roman times. Just we have a we know a very, 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 very few about the Roman army, right? We are terribly lucky that this was a universal empire, produced a lot of sources, but there's still very few, I mean, in what they remain. And, and yeah. <laughs>
So another very important passing to the offensive armament. So among the weapons, there is a very important one that takes, you know, that gains its own place even among infantry here. That is the spata, right? Uh, between the end of the second and the first um, years of the third century, the short uh, Pompeii Gladius type uh, seems to disappear almost completely from the representations of the times leaving space to the long spa type, right? Also within the infantry units, right? As we have said before, the spa type was more typically the cavalry sword of the Roman army, right? And uh, it had been since probably the third century, uh, or, or right around there. The uh, later on, say better, because there were also other types, but this is another topic we, we don't address. Um, but in general, it had consistently spread further, and especially from the late Republic onwards, we know that that was the thing. And as we were saying before, don't be, mm, don't let yourself tricked by the fact that Gladius, by those previous times, was that different from the Spata, actually. They were pretty similar in shape and length. Um, and also in here, we don't know clearly what was the predominant reason of this typological transformation in the late Roman times. And But there are several theories re related to this. Uh, first of all, and the kind of the most obvious in a certain sense, is the increased uh, need to meet enemies on horseback, right? Um, so the Spata has this shifted... Uh, a balance towards the tip that is uh, excellent for r hitting from the above and uh, this this design will substantially remain well through the, the middle ages the early middle ages is uh, you know the prevalent type also for the the, the ar archetypus of the uh, medieval knight essentially um, another element talking about infantry proper actually uh, is the this kind of uh, transformation of Roman infantry towards a more phalangitic type Right when you, when you say phalangitic type here, you don't have to think it was like the the ancient hoplites or or, or Macedonian pikemen. Right, um, uh, there are many differences in here. There are very different societies. They don't fight in the same way. Once again, there is not a standard package of unit f formation or tactics that must be copied from other models. This is a stupid modernistic obsession that the the, the, the easier and the quicker we erase from our mindset completely, and the better it is. Um, but as we were saying before, there is this increase of of the so of the fulcon, as it was known from fold, from, from the people, like for this uh, the Germanic terminologies of the um, terminology of the many that entering in the uh, many names entering in the Roman army at this time. Um, that means that people. I mean, the idea is that I mean the, the same Greeks back in the day called the uh, Celtic uh, infantry uh, the phalanx because. In Greek, actually, phalanx is not the, the specific categorical term of, of those politic, Hellenic or politic phalanxes of the classical age or the, uh, the Hellenistic, of the Macedonian ones of the Hellenistic one. It, it's, it, for, for the Greeks, it was every type of heavy infantry, right? So that's uh, the, especially in a kind of a more or less thick RA, right? As mo normally infantries were at the time. Um, even the ones of the barbarians. And actually, this sticking together, that this myth, for example, that the barbarians fought scattered is complete garbage right um all 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 peoples fought um like they could be more or less cohesive as a formation but th th this has nothing to do with the, the order that they have they're actually compact and sources insists that the peoples like the the, the germans at this time had a very like the strategon for example that they, they had a pretty sound compact uh front line uh, of shields and spears um, and, and this is what the Romans also basically revert to or uh, adapt to, and with these flatter shields that allow the overlapping, what what the concaves could, as we've seen before, couldn't afford them to do, um, and therefore this kind of more uh, defensivistic uh, tactical employment at a first uh, glance, if you want. Um, but not only because you said, but what does uh, Aspata then does among the, I don't know, the, the Comentatensis infantry if, uh, you know, you have a shield wall, you can even properly and easily, uh, e more easily use it. Well, as we will see, the, the, the spear was also uh, employed largely. 
there were also different types of infantry, but we don't have time to enter in detail. But the point is that when uh, when probably the, the the fight went on, and uh, the troops were uh, the formations were worn out, as if some gap opened, right? You could more easily ha employ this longer, longer, longer sword, um, or to pursue the enemy. That is another. You know, having a, sp a, a, a weapon like a spata with, uh, within a, an infantry that must um, suffer all their uh, this, this stresses, uh, like um, massive charges uh, of enemies, and then it, it, it's quite eloquent of, of a type of fight that fundamentally um, uh, involves a, a, a a some, somewhat increased individualism, or better, the, the capacity of passing, even from this thickly compact formations immediately, maybe all of the sudden, into a charge. Which is, after all, what the Celts, the Germans, had already done, like as barbarian peoples back in the day. Right? This capacity of sticking together, um, uh, taking all the, the thing the Romans could throw at them, and then uh, when this stopped and the Romans charged, they also opening the, the wall and, and charging. Uh, straight in employing more individually this this sword, right? Um, this is the the employment that we think was used. Uh, the the Roman the earlier Roman legionnaire didn't need this because it was enough to to stay at close contact with his companions to bear the burden of of of, of the fight more or less individually. But having these guys in, in the in the sides that could help him and meeting with this. Um, more loose um, formations of the enemy when when they attacked or kind of uh, disrupting their formation by throwing the the pila in and and closing in with the with the with the gladius at a, at a, you know stamping 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 um, very quickly and um, causing this intensive immediate disruption of the enemy infantry to make it flee right and then for lighter units to pursue them. Here, the situation is less clear than that, right? Because the, the levels of, um, you know, of, of combativity, let's say, are, um, are high um, from both sides, and even the levels of compaction are higher, um, especially from the barbarian side. So you, it, it's a much more symmetric fight than it seems, and you you do need both this capacity to stick in a shield wall and, and piercing, but maybe with a spear better. Um, I know there are lots of you to follow channels like Lindy Bash to say that especially this wasn't quite of a thing, especially in overarm grip, but actually it was, um, in at least in, in, in certain contexts. Not uh, and the the point though is. It, is that the, the sword, this pata by itself is a hell of a sword that requires a lot of training and you can't do a lot of things with. So, uh, you've seen these legions are also smaller, that there is um, right, uh, um, um, somewhat a, a need of, of greater defensiveness, of, of greater aggressiveness depending on the situation. So that's a very, very convenient weapon for, for both tasks in many ways. And it's definitely an increase of the quality um, of the troops that are using it compared to the Gladius by itself, definitely. Um, so, there are also archaeological finds that, um, that show quite clearly that the Romans were imitating, even not just because they hired them, but I mean Germanic swords um, by aesthetical taste, right, and that there was at least a very intense Germanic uh, cultural influence among the Romans themselves, aside from the most obvious uh, integration of Germanic elements in their army. But it's um, once again the, the sword in itself is very important. Uh, it can tell you a lot of things, but once again, it it's also rel it's just a variable within a broader system here. Um, so uh, the the this path was um was roughly between 50 and 70 centimeters long right and also the width usually uh, increased in proportion there are all interesting data in this regard 
and that we don't have the time to to pull it. But it, it's obvious, as we were saying before, it, that it, it becomes a, a, a pro, uh, increasingly a much more demanding web, right? The idea that the the proto nightly um, let's say military model is is within this I don't know Constantinian uh, uh, horseman. It, it, it is true. It, it's it's going towards that. There, there is definitely also a, a social certification, and uh, the, the therefore the, the those guys who belong to the higher levels of society were kind of the, the most elite units, the most f fighting as m ever more professionally. And uh, equipped to fight in every single kind of situation. The Spada is useful in that regard because it doesn't oblige you necessarily to rely exclusively on a sp with a spear that can can break. So it requires um, it, it's a it's a very expensive and ineffective weapon that um, that can serve it to, to many multiple roles and requires a higher degree of training, right? And um, there are other elements in the gear and equipment that we can't uh, stop. But um, interestingly enough, uh, also other soldiers, also spearmen, brought other t uh, some kind of swords with them. It was the so-called semispata. It was evidently a shorter, uh, shorter and lighter uh, sword. It was a kind of a side weapon, right? Um, it was um, a short weapon for the um, for close range fight, right, very close range uh, melee, um, in which even the same spot would have been less uh, effective in a certain sense, but, you know, side weapons of this kind can fit in very, in a very broad uh, context of functionally speaking. There was the Pugio, traditionally, it is ornamental uh, weapon characteristic of the per legionaries of the first century that seems to disappear uh, but this period already from the second half of the second century is not much of it but there are um, a similar example of uh, Pugionis that are um, morphologically similar to the ones of the two previous centuries in uh, certain si sites in Germany from the second half of the third century um, together with uh, other weapons uh, that are probably semi spata right? And but starting from the fourth century, both um, the pugiones and the semi spata result um, absent, right? And from the archaeological evidence, and there were other types of smaller weapons. But what really changes here a big deal is really missile fire. Um, as you know, the Romans had used the pilum as this heavy javelin throughout these previous centuries. Um, it was a very, a much more, um, flag, I mean, multi-role weapons that we can imagine. We uh, stereotypically associated to it to the standardly uh, performed um, javelin salvo, let's say, on the enemy lines before charging, and in part it is true, but it wasn't performed all the time, right, that, that's a pr that's kind of a, a misconception, we also have to address at another time, that this was done all the time uh, as a regular form of engagement, it, it, it's not really true, most of the times probably these weapons were used to skirmish, right, uh, at a distance, um, and you needed certain specific um, ways of using it, sometimes they were used also defensively, there, there is a, same exam uh, one example was from the Gallic Wars, um, and for all the 3rd century the pilum continued to be part of the um, uh, characteristic gear of the legionnaire as several archaeological finds and some iconographical evidence uh, with this and, and they, they seem to become longer and thinner though um, and they're proudly showed in, in some funerary plates and the fact that they're thinning down already speaks for what would be the, the, the further transformation. According to Vegetius that he writes as we've seen between the end of the fourth and the, the first um the first fifth century, the typical equipment of the uh heavy infantrymen, 
of his times um, included two uh, missile weapons. Um, one that was heavier and coinciding with the older pilum, right? Um, in part, at least, known as spiculum, right? It had a triangular section, was in part in, in, um, in, in uh, iron, uh, with 22 centimeters long, and with a wooden shaft of 162 centimeters. Um, this is interesting because, as you know, the the pilum actually had already had two, usually two types. I mean, the Roman legionaries had two types, a heavier one and a lighter one. They, they were designed to, to engage the enemy at different distance, right, for this coordinated throw. Um, the lighter one and the longer, for, for the longer distance and the, sh the, the shorter one for the closer distance. Um, and the jet says, in fact, there was a second type as well, at these times, that called... Um, uh, originally like the Vericulum or Verutum later at least um, that had uh, that was sensibly shorter right it had the iron part of 12 centimeters long and the wooden shaft of 103 um, so um, this was evidently this could be framed even s semantically into the Lancia group right that it could be thrown at a, a longer range than the Pilum and that's what, in fact, probably gave the name to the Lanciari that we were talking about before, that from some iconographic evidence carried between three or five, right? Which is not a lot for a skirmisher. I mean, uh, there were, I mean, yeah, it's probably the average of what they, 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 could be, uh, they could bring with them. But the important is that these troops were not just skirmishers uh, as well. Uh, also, Mianus uh, confirms uh, the... Uh, the use at the time of 4th, 5th century of such weapons, right? Um, and archaeologically speaking, uh, the picture we get is um, more uh, complex because there is an enormous range of types of javelins, right? And um, with different tips, different lengths, um, and even, mm, I mean, shapes, right? And this is important. And... Um, in, in another part of his work, Vegetius actually states that the pilum had fallen in disuse uh, at his own time, right? In that there were uh, other um, uh, peoples like the barbarians that, um, with in their heavy infantry, still made use of of them, like the with the, the bad brother we talked about before, and they carried two or three, right? So th that's very similar to to the Roman pilum. It's basically the same thing, um, and there is still um like th there are other types that um form for example the famous um uh, a type that is very famous to the angon that appears on the Rhine uh starting from the 4th century uh, you know that the angon would become very famous especially in the early middle ages during 6th 7th century especially among the franks in the area this is another probably roman borrowing I in this regard uh i mean a uh, a Frankish borrowing from from the Romans, but then and and uh, and this was a, an important element that somewhat remained invariant, right? Then we we see the smaller darts were used that were that really deeply increased um, the m missile f uh, offensive of 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 the Roman infantry at this point. But before, let's talk about the uh, stopping. Uh, spear, the the hasta, right? Um, there, this is not very. Um, I mean, the stopping weapon uh, was was you know pretty common after all, even in previous times. It's just that it's not paraded so much for some reason. And uh, from the third and th fifth century, the stopping uh, lengths um, increases. In uh, in appearance, right, especially in the iconographical representations, and it becomes um, almost substitutive of the pilum, right, towards the fifth century, and it basically constitutes the the primary weapon uh, with which the heavy infantryman is provided coherently uh, with um, the as we've seen the, the phalangitic. Asset of the Roman formations often employed. 
and from the fourth century there are also other types of uh, lances of Germanic origin that spread like the Zaufeda that is was for boar, boar hunting and it had its wings um, to harpoon the shields or, or to stop the 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 blows during the, to parry the blows during the, the fight right uh, rather than it, it was pretty good at, you know to, to pierce through through armor in some instances um, and the mm, there, there were also in here different shapes right also for creating more uh, horrendous wounds either f for infect or chop right and th this is important because um, this was a pretty brutal. Uh, fighting and it, it it does require right it, this um, these weapons require a certain kind of uh, relatively sophisticated fencing to be employed. Uh, so imagine the shield walls like hedgehogs that advance and kind of uh, fight it very um, you know cohesively uh, against each other like a, at waves like back and forth back and forth. But in, in all of this, what actually probably served to, to the greatest use to, to the Romans um, in, in most circumstances was this lighter weapon that appears during the 4th century, which is the so-called plumbata, right? This is kind of ha it's a dart, essentially. It's a halfway between a javelin and an arrow, I ideally speaking. It is, is um, thrown by hand, this typical, you know, uh, down uh, throw, like bringing the the arm behind you and then swinging it in front of you like that and um, it it was something like 50 centimeters long right, it's somewhat it, 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 it also in here the size could vary but it was a, a substantial uh, dart and the plumbatai were, could be also used in attack in some ways but it was more um, effective probably in defense, right? In actually piercing uh, the, the the enemy at, at a distance, like uh, transforming it in a, in, a, in a pinch cushion. The more it advanced, um, and it was um, in part uh, somewhat m probably more typical light infantry, but there are legionnaires that were employing it as well. That there were actually specific lodgings in the shields for the plumbatae. And um, the uh, the anonymous author of the Darebus Bellicis distinguishes between two types of plumbata, the mamillata and the tribolata one. The mamillata was, um, you know, very f was smooth, right, chiefly for piercing and um, w increased with, uh, you know, th this uh, land weight in the middle, like to maintain also the stability of, of the throw of the projectile in, in the air. Um, this this hat was stabilized also by plumes, etc. And the Tribolata one was um, a bit different because it had the sort of spikes uh, uh, at the height of the counterweight, I mean, of the uh, heavier part in the middle that basically could um, uh, either pierce because it had it still the, the, the tip naturally, but um, you know, while falling on the ground, like piercing their feet when they pass by, right? Because this thing, whatever it fell, it had a spike from 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 the up, uh, the, uh, pointing up, and that was its main, um, you know, the distinctive character. But the point is that these plumbatae were quite, uh, you know, quite a presence on the battlefield. The younger were often the youth was trained with this weapon. Uh, they were known also as matzo barboli, right? And these were weapons that, in a way or another, had always been around in some way, like the, this half javelins, that um, even a um, spicula of some sort. I mean, uh, it was a great variety of it. What is very interesting about the uh, the plumbata is that, in fact. Th there are lots of archaeological finds, even if literary sources are not so, you know, fond of it. You, there is not such a lot of, inf of of information, but they can be found, even mentioned by the Strategicon, even up to the sixth century. Um, so this stuff uh, remained around for a, for a long time. It was probably very effective. Um, the only problem is that, uh, albeit there's been some consistent amount of experimental archaeology in this stuff, is that.
because you find quite easily around uh, scholars quoting uh, size uh, talk about 70 80 uh, meters in range but other recent tests had put the, this the 70 80 meters range is the also the effective range of a bow at the time it's a bit realistic somewhat um, and uh, test seems that actually the maximum range was something around 50 60 meters and they, they haven't made it to, to the longer range but it's still consistent right it's not maybe the, the useful range proper but if you throw these things all at once against an advanced information against cavalry right it's largely unarmored it's going to make some damage um, and some consistent damage and it's definitely longer than a javelin range and we got to believe, first of all, they knew how to use them and to produce them, especially better than we do. So it's possible also 70, 80 centimeters. But think about what, what this whole thing means. I mean, think about this plus archery, right? Archers uh, increase uh, in, late, in the late Roman army, uh, both on foot and on horseback. Um, and the most widespread type of bow was the composite type of oriental or Scythic type. And in fact, this weapon was much, probably much more widespread than we think, also since a longer uh, age. Uh, there were probably some certain cultural stereotypes towards the, uh, I mean, prejudices towards the bow, probably even in European culture in some ways, right? The same. I suspect it's true for the Greeks, the Romans, the the Germans, the Celts. Probably there was a, a greater use of the bow than we can see, right? Slings were usually more favored in the the classical antiquity, but we, we it's difficult maybe to, to see well. What do we know in that in the fourth century, even before the Hunnic invasion actually, um, Central Europe saw a consistent amount of, of, of bows in, in, in the practice of warfare especially uh, along the Danubian frontier because it was full of Sarmatian horsemen around who actually made use of the Hunnic or what we call the Hunnic bow proper it was asymmetric, it was different from the Scythic ones um, and it, it was much more powerful it, it allowed better the, the horsemen to, to handle it on, on horseback so these peoples that knew with this other central uh, Asian populations had already uh, had already them on their own and the Romans had already known this type of bows uh, ever since, uh, even if they they used uh, they made a you know lesser use of them compared to these populations. So what you have to imagine, like in in the Roman army, um, is is this incredible missile firepower that was really um, was really amazing, right? Imagine to 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 attack a Roman legion of late empire. And you basically approach it the uh, 250 meters that are the uh, Sagittae Balistaria, you know, that there is mounted artillery that can target you with this huge pulse. And at 250 meters, it's maximum range of, of bows, um, and uh, you, you start falling under it. Then at 80 meters, the Plumbatae, right? At 40 meters, the Lanchae, and at 50 meters, the Spicola, right? Um, so think of what it means, right? You're you're targeted continuously. Think about keeping order of formations, especially think about the damage to cavalry um, that is largely unarmored, and um, think about the uh, even the infantry. I mean, having to go more slowly on this. Uh, on, on under this fire and having to close in but by com being constantly harassed by this right Th this video was just to to show the effectiveness of the Roman infantry and to 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 explain what it became like uh, for which reason right and um, it's not easier um, to explain than by talking about tactics proper but passing through the equipment of the legionnaire can make you realize for a moment what the capacities of these troops fundamentally were, right? It's not just about judging uh, an ideal type that you maybe don't even contextualize, but rather understanding that to uh, an increase of, speciali uh, of specialization that corresponds even to the uh, 
the lightening of certain models and the hemming of others in certain cases, not so even in the infantry, but you know, still maintaining at least the earlier standards, uh, is the increase of the, the combined arm effects that are devastating and that the early uh, legion wasn't probably that um, used to do. Like the early legion had a great uh, artillery firepower already uh, and this uh, smashing heavy infantry capacity, but then it probably wasn't excessively coordinated with other elements of the army, right? Because everything was fairly simpler. The enemies were, were more stationary and uh, even more passive by a certain uh, standard. So uh, at this point, the whole thing was changing rapidly, brutally, less resources. Therefore, you have to increase the tactical effectiveness that largely passes through training and the capacity of manning these units, incorporating together by uh, targeting the enemy as much as... Uh, stopping it um, in the front uh, with a solid wall and to to even operate with cavalry that we haven't seen today but that was also a pretty dynamic quick one and the the quality the, the training was at the very best um, the um, the capacity of fielding these troops progressively declines especially in the west during the fifth century but the military standard itself remains excellent, and there is no other army out here that matches the same standards of the Roman one, by the slightest. So, as long as there is a Roman state functioning, there is a Roman army that is effective as ever, and even more, uh, what it takes to, uh, you know, to tactical interaction, right? And this is particularly true, especially in the eastern part, where certain... Um, you know, th this philosophy is somewhat enhanced and the resources allow to, to perform it. And um, the um, capacity to, um, to, 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 to deploy these troops is, um, is more consistent, right, over, over the centuries. But, once again, it's not a problem of the military effectiveness of these tactical formulas it's about the, the the lack of resources for maintaining them in standing right so that is why in the west this progressively this gradually um, uh, decreases but in the east this is maintained and but ev not even in the western roman empire you see a qualitative decline as long as the roman state was able to field these troops and a lot more should be said in this divarication between West and East that we, we can't talk about now. But just remember that, after all, they're not... Um, I mean, they're important differences, but I I also in the way peoples actually fought at the time um, wasn't, uh, didn't, uh, wasn't so different after all. I mean, there was not this, this huge asymmetry. Um, as as we think it, and it's true that this gap is being bridged ever and ever, so that in the West you have a Romano-Germanic society that produces a certain ca type of military that is effective on its own, and the uh, the Eastern Romans at that point are still you know the, some of the most functional. Or once again, it's the state behind it that really makes the difference, rather than at this point the, the tactical thing in itself that naturally is increasingly also copied by other peoples that also employ their means in a way that is, is more functional for their politics and society and are um, you know capable of providing also different and tactical answers to to the to the same threat that the Romans posed but that's another story and we'll see it another time but for now I think I would stop it here. I don't know how much I would have li liked to add, um, but um, it would be probably too much to continue. I don't know how long this video has been. It's probably two hours, more than two hours. But anyhow, it doesn't quite matter. What matters is that we focused, finally, in, on this idea that, that, that the transformation of legionary equipment in, in later Roman Empire doesn't display any um, doctrinal uh, decline, right? But the very contrary of it, uh, and the the results were seen on the field, right? Especially.
uh, you know, if Julian hadn't died, has been assassinated in his campaign, it would have been terribly even, especially against the Sassanians that were basically always on, you know, leaving the, the initiative to the, uh, to the Romans because they, the, the Romans were too effective for them and that was the greatest threat the Romans were, were meeting, definitely. Um, with the Germans, it was also a series of victories. Think about the Battle of of, uh, of Argentonata, um, and uh, the uh, that we also made a video about. And we will keep talking about these battles to really make us understand better what we're talking about about the solidity, the resilience, the the this compactness. Of, of this model, right, and and how efficiently all these various arms were integrated, right? On the video on the Battle of Strasbourg, this is Argentoratum, that, that is pretty, pretty evident, right? When you see the Alemanni charging straight into the Roman lines and even managing to break the first ranks, uh, but stopping at the, the first line, stopping in the second, because they the, the Romans had the strength even to cope with that impact. It was basically unmediated because they they took the the, the wall charge in and uh, this is very important right very very important but anyhow uh, we will come back on these topics on another occasion um, and once again I would like to uh, to add so much but we'll do it another time and for so all what concerns formations etc we will cover it all, hopefully, right? So don't worry. Even if today we we talk loosely only about the the legionary equipment, the the infantrymen, legionary infantry equipment, um, we we will extend it to the whole thing later on. So for now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.